Dr. Gerald Diaz is a physician, former software engineer, and founder of GrepMed, a free image-based medical reference platform that serves as a more efficient alternative to text-heavy resources. Their mission is to democratize the medical reference space to reduce clinician burnout by leveraging images to shortcut the information retrieval process. He wants to make it easier for us to find stuff. GrepMed makes it easy for clinicians to find, share, and bookmark management algorithms, checklists, decision aids, diagnostic schemas, POCUS videos, physical exam clips, and much more. GrepMed recently crossed over 800,000 image impressions per day and is being used in over 190 countries worldwide. We talk about how he started to develop the app. He gives some advice for those out there with an idea for an application what the term ramen profitable means and why that applies to bootstrapping your own business like he did, and how he tries to stay on top of the search engine algorithms. Dr. Diaz graduated from Stanford with a BS in computer science and worked as a software developer for four years before receiving his MD from St. Louis University. He completed two years of radiology training before switching specialties to internal medicine and then completed his residency at UCSD in 2016. He currently works full-time as a hospitalist while bootstrapping the development of GrepMed as a side project. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from Physician Financial Services, a business widely recognized in the physician community for disability insurance. Circumstantially, it also happens to be located about five minutes from my house. Lawrence B. Keller, CFP, has been in the insurance and financial services industry since 1990. Unlike medicine, which has a standardized path that physicians must take to gain the education, training, and experience requirements necessary to obtain board certification, the insurance and financial services industry does not. So working with an agent that is familiar with the underwriting process of both disability and life insurance policies for physicians can all but guarantee a smooth underwriting process in which the desired outcome is likely. While he might not be a doctor's first phone call regarding their insurance needs, he is often their last. Find Larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash Larry Keller or at the link in the show notes. Dr. Gerald Diaz, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Brad. I'm really excited to be here. So my first question is, do you have to live in the Bay Area in order to get into health tech? Uh, You know, I think especially with the coronavirus situation going on, you definitely don't have to be in the Bay Area. I think you'll find if you pay attention to the startup sort of news currently going on is that there's been a massive exodus actually away from the big cities into the smaller areas. So there's not a lot of networking events happening right now. Everything's pretty much moving online. And so you definitely don't have to be in the Bay Area. You know, I started GrepMed when I was in Sacramento, which is not typically known to be part of the Silicon Valley. Um, I think uh, there are lots of ways to find people that can help you on your journey if you're interested in healthcare and technology. So what is GrepMed? First, how'd you come up with the name? And second, what what is it? Yeah, so GrepMed, I guess, is a relic of my time as a former software engineer. So grep is an old Unix command that helps you search through large text files and extract important data. And so um, GrepMed is basically an image-based medical reference platform. We're sort of like Pinterest or Instagram, but useful for clinicians and physicians. You know, basically, we think that a picture is worth a thousand words. And instead of traditional medical reference resources where you get, you know, just uh, inundated with walls of text, uh, you search for something and you get an algorithm, a checklist, a decision aid, uh, something like that that really cuts through the information overload and helps you find the information that you need to make better decisions at the bedside. So do you try to limit it to high yield information or it's just, you know, how do you decide what gets included and what doesn't? Uh, So it's not necessarily high yield, but um, stuff that's really just useful for uh, clinicians at uh, many different levels. And so probably some of our most um, popular content is 
pretty boring mundane tables. So pharmacology tables, Lasix conversion, beta blocker conversion, uh, stuff like that, that, um, you know, really gets a lot of views. Um, but a lot of different things like, you know, certain algorithms for hyponatremia is kind of our canonical example, adrenal insufficiency, really stuff that um, is hard to parse out of regular textbooks, which is what you sort of see on resources like up to date or Medscape. Got it. I okay. think all of us, you know, whenever we find some of these articles, we tend to jump towards the pictures really quickly to find what we want. Yeah, right. You get a good table and it really helps you understand rather than looking through text, which is, I guess, that's where grep came from. So how do you vet the, comment, the, the content? How do you decide what goes in and, and what doesn't go in? Like, what's the mechanism we're sort of depending on our community to help police the content that's on our website. You know, we we offer ourselves as a platform for medical educators to share really high yield content that they might have made for their morning report or for grand rounds. And, um, you know, we try to source back to the original website wherever possible to give credit to where um, the creators and the authors. And then as far as vetting the content, we do receive a little bit of spam, but um, I personally make sure that all the content um, is coming from a reputable source, reputable people and users. And we do rely on our, our community in, in terms of comments to make sure that uh, people aren't uh, you know, putting uh, non-reputable information onto our website. Got it. So it's self-policing and you police it as well. Yeah, we have an editorial team that's mostly comprised of me, but you know, <laughs> I think in the future we're going to rely on ways to downvote, to implement ways to downvote content or flag content that uh, might not be appropriate for consumption. Got it. Is there any way to review content to make sure it's not outdated? Although it doesn't seem like most of the stuff you, you would have wouldn't be outdated very quickly, if at all. Yeah, so far it hasn't seemed to be too much of a problem. I think um, medicine in general moves a little bit slower than we think in terms of uh, the core uh, subject material. Uh, but um, I think we're hoping that uh, people will chime in in our con comments, and they have in certain instances, especially on social media, where they point us to more updated algorithms, you know, updated guidelines. And so it does take a bit of time to, you know, make sure that we're updating some of this um, information. If you have pictures, how do you make sure that everything is HIPAA compliant? Uh, you know, again, I think um, we're relying on our community to help police that. But most of what's been shared has already been shared online in other places, such as, you know, the free open access medical education community that's on Twitter. And so people tend to do a pretty good job of policing what they've put on Twitter. And if anybody, you know, tells us that, uh, you know, it's something's been put up there without permission and we simply take it down. To date, we haven't had a single instance where somebody has asked us to take down something that's on our website. So you have, you have POCUS, right? Po point of care, ultrasound and physical exam clips. Any plan to expand on that format? Maybe to include either surgical procedures, like bedside procedures or surgery videos? Yeah, we've actually started to do some of that. Um, it's sort of just a matter of uh, finding that content and curating and sourcing it. And so uh, we've actually been accumulating quite a bit of uh, colonoscopy and endoscopy clips recently. Um, some of that is just, um, there aren't actually a lot of other good resources online for these things. And so we're, we're relying on people to uh, upload these images for us and uh, point us in the right direction in terms of resources that are available. You know, physical exam clips and point of care ultrasound. There's something that's uh, really been popular on Instagram and Twitter. And so that's something that we've really been focused on, on highlighting on our social media presence just because it gets a lot of likes and retweets and it gets people to come back to our website when they know they've seen a really interesting clip somewhere already. So what's the next iteration of GrepMed? What, what's coming down the pipe? Well, I think um, the biggest step for us is trying to be a more complete database. And so I think a lot of people, you're not going to go back to Wikipedia if you search for something and, you know, you know, half the time you don't get a search result that's relevant to what you're looking for. So our goal is in the next coming years is to 10x our database in terms of our size, our breadth and our depth. Um, you know, more recently, what we've been focusing on, we've got a big user interface rehaul coming down the pipeline, and we've been improving our search functionality as well. Before, it was all hashtag-based search, kind of like Instagram, where you need to search according to, hands, to hashtags, which wasn't 
that good unless you type uh, your search queries exactly um, the way the hashtags are specified. But now we're doing more of a context sensual uh, sensitive search. What does that mean? Well, I think, um, you know, before, if you type in hyponatremia algorithm, uh, you'd have to type in those exact words versus uh, now we'll actually be able to search the description itself to sort of pick up uh, more fuzzy matches, I guess, rather than exact searches. Okay. Okay. So if you get it a little, little wrong or a little not, you know, not maybe even if you're not quite sure what you're looking for, you'll end up with uh, some good information. Yeah. So what was the inf- inspiration for GrepMed? How did you think of it? Well, I think, um, you know, it was just frustration with our, you know, traditional medical reference resources. Most of the resources that you use, at least for internists and emergency medicine doctors, I found are basically just textbooks that have been thrown online. And for me, when I'm on a busy shift, when I'm seeing 20 or 30 patients in a day, you know, you just don't have time to sit down and read through all of that junk. I think there's just so much cognitive overload that we have, you know, in the form of text, just in our electronic medical record system that, um, you know, I just personally get so frustrated with having to parse through so much text. And so I found myself just, you know, jumping to Google image search to try to shortcut the information process. And uh, Google images is actually pretty good, but um, I think so much of it is, you know, a lot of spam. There's a lot of patient-oriented information. So much of what's on Google Images is also hidden behind paywalls that makes it hard to get to. And so, um, you know, that was sort of, you know, we're trying to unbundle Google Image Search and Pinterest and Instagram in a way that uh, is useful for for doctors. So you want it so that every trainee, every attending has on their smartphone a GrepMed app so that when they're not sure of something, this is where they look it up. Rather than using Google, which searches everything, you want it to be so full of information, but good and useful information that they turn to you rather than Google to search for what they're looking for. Yeah, I think you've probably noticed this, but uh, Google kind of sucks these days. Um, <laughs> there's just uh, so much content that, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're listening to you right now. And now they're going to put you to the bottom <laughs> of the algorithm. I'm sorry. It was a good run. Yeah, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, there's just so much content out there. There's so many people actually generating content in a way to try to scam the search engines to try to get people to their website um, and to get those clicks and those advertising dollars that um, they're really fighting an uphill battle to try to find out what's relevant. And so, you know, even if you try to search for our website, it's hard to find actually if you search through it just because there's so many websites that are uh, from 10 years ago that uh, are on that first search page of the results that um, are hard to knock off. But, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of value to hand curating a lot of the content that we have on our database. And we have uh, upvoting mechanisms that users can sort of vote content that's, you know, really good and also bookmarking capabilities so that if something's really useful for you that you use it very often, if you bookmark it, that's a signal to us that uh, it's probably useful to other people as well. Yeah. I think... One thing that's important to to realize is that, you know, we're here as a, a reference resource. We're not here to teach people medicine. And so you still have to use your own clinical judgment uh, to make sure that you, you vet the images on your own. You know, it's supposed to be stuff that you've already seen before. And sometimes a lot of our tables are really just useful for you to think about that 10th zebra that it doesn't come to your mind when you're at the bedside. Why did you decide to bootstrap this? Why did you, rather than maybe looking for an investor, right? You do live in Northern California, look for venture capital somewhere, uh, but you decided to fund this yourself. And really it's, it's so far unpaid extra work. So what, what made you decide to go that route? Yeah, there's actually a pretty big indie hacker community that's uh, growing. I think um, when you look at the Silicon Valley and you read all the headlines, you you hear all of the stories about people who raise millions and hundreds of millions of dollars for their venture scale opportunities and, and problems and ideas. But when you raise venture capital, I think uh, those venture capitalists are looking for venture scale returns, which typically means that um, if you're not making a billion dollars or so, you don't anticipate uh, your company being worth a billion dollars, then 
probably most of those companies, 90% of them end up going to zero. And so in my situation as a fresh graduating, attending, you know, knowing that I have a lot of loans to pay off, it'd be hard for me to just, you know, drop my clinical responsibilities and work full time on a project like this. And so, you know, I knew as a former software engineer that this is something that I, I, I thought I could build on the side. Um, it turned out that um, it is quite time consuming. And so finding a co-founder for me was probably the best thing. But um, I think I um, for from our perspective, uh, slow and steady wins the race. And so, you know, if we can get this to, you know, very profitable, you know, side hustle, I think I'd be very happy. I think our main goal is to really be able to, you know, reach as many people as possible. I think what you're saying is that most people end up swinging for the fences and then end up striking out. So the people that get the venture capital money are the ones that are swinging for the fences. And the investors are just hoping that one of them does extremely well, knowing that most of them are going to fail. Whereas your philosophy is more, I'm going to hit a solid single and see where it goes and take it from there. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think you'll see, you know, some founders, you know, they'll raise $100 million, but at the end of the day, if they go public, they might not own more than 5 or 10% of that, which is actually, that's quite a bit. But you also see the case where, you know, people sell their company and they might 2x all of the money that's raised. And the most of that money has to go back to the people, the investors first, before they see any of that. Yeah. So, you know, for us, I'd like to just build something that has impact first. And I know that if a lot of people are using our project, then I'm sure there's going to be a, an easy way to monetize that later. Yeah, yeah. How did you end up getting a co-founder, though, if there was no part of the business plan that includes monetization? Yeah, so I think that uh, for me... A lot of that was a little bit of luck. Um, and so I, I would encourage people if they're looking at starting uh, their own software project, if they're a clinician, you know, try to network as much as possible. Try to go to some of these events. I know it's harder during the times of coronavirus, but you know, I always tell people if you have a problem that you think you have a solution for, you should probably tell as many people as possible about your idea. One, it helps you validate whether or not this is a good idea. And um, for me, I found it's my co-founder, Kian Gushad, actually at a, a networking event for for founders. And for me, it was an idea that I was excited about. I thought I was just going to do it on my own, but finding him, you know, he thought it was a good idea. He was actually kind of working on multiple different projects um, all at the same time. And it was something that we both knew we could have an equal commitment um, doing part-time um, and building up slowly. And so it, it just seemed to be a perfect match for us. Do you have an end game or it's more, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm trying to grow it. And there's no not necessarily an end game. Yeah, I, I think our end game is uh, number one. I think um, the short term end game would be for the to make this profitable in terms of paying for itself, run profitable, if you will. So, um, you know, right now, you know, I, I I really enjoyed your talk with Dr. Tissa, where you're talking about how you don't encourage people to start a podcast because you're <laughs> so far in the red. And so, <laughs> yes. you know, for us, you know, this is a, an image based medical reference website. It's got a lot of videos on there. So the bandwidth costs are actually pretty heavy. It's a few hundred dollars per month. And so if we could find a way to just just make ourselves, you know, ramen profitable so that we don't have to pay for bandwidth every month. I think that would be goal number one. Sorry, ramen uh, profitable? Yeah, I think that just means where you're not losing money every okay. month so that you can <laughs> Never pay heard for. that term before. It's a, it's that a, might be a Northern California thing. It's a common thing. term in the Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I think... Um, it, it, a lot of startups, they talk about being default alive or default dead. And another term is being ramen profitable, where you're actually able to feed yourself based on your company's uh, income. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so, so let's say someone has an idea that would require software engineering, right? Uh, they have an idea for an app or something like that, right? But they don't have a degree in software engineering like you do. Right. So where do they begin? They just go to Fiverr? Do you have to go to these founder meetups? Like, how do you get started? So I, I think if you, you find a problem and you, you validate that there's an actual need for this problem, I think you would, that's the number one step is making sure that you know it's something that you have a lot of conviction in. The next step, I think, is deciding, I guess it's different for every person, but what kind of resources do you have at your disposable? You know, if you're someone that's in a lot of debt um, or if you're someone with a lot of disposable income because you don't have a lot of student loans, uh, then it might be feasible to go on to someplace like Fiverr or Upwork 
and to find a software developer that can create what's called a, a MVP or a, a um, minimum viable product um, to sort of, you know, create a version of your software that can address these needs that you can start to really sell people on. In my case, I found someone that was really, con- I think if you can find a co-founder that's willing to take on equity in the company instead, then it's a way to avoid, you know, paying for really 10, 20, $30,000 for an MVP of an app or a website, um, because you'd be surprised how quickly uh, the cost can add up, especially, you know, if you're going to a, um, some sort of a studio um, to create your website, um, you know, you'll find that just the maintenance cost for a website or a product can add up to thousands of dollars per month. So here's my idea for an app. I'm sure you hear this all the time. And tell me, tell me if you think this is viable or not. And feel free, any of the listeners, take it, run with it, right? When I'm commuting to work, you know what I'd like to know? Which of my friends are also commuting to work? Who else is in the car right now that I could just dial them up and I know that they're going to pick up rather than like scrolling through eight different friends trying to figure out who else is in the car right now and getting it wrong and then, you know, just listening to podcasts, which is great, by the way, listening to podcasts. It would be nice for me to know who else is driving and how much time they have left in their drive. And then I can be like, hey, I'm going to call Gerald and talk to him because he's got 15 minutes left in his commute. And it shows here that it's on green. So he's available to talk. What do you think? That's actually a great idea. Did you actually just come up with that on the fly? or Not on the fly. No, I've thought about it before. I've thought about it before and ran it by one person and they thought it was a terrible idea. So, Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I think it might depend on who you talk to. I think uh, the younger generation, people like myself, we don't like to talk to people on the phone anymore. We actually get a lot of anxiety when people uh, call you. And so people, the younger generation uh, likes to text now more than talk. But um, that's not bad. It's actually almost kind of like... Uh, Tinder for your friends on um, on the phone. So, you know, if you have spare time to kill and you have a list of people that you're interested in talking to, yeah. why not match it up and uh, see who's available? That's I have like actually not bad. 20, 25 minutes each way when I'm commuting. And typically I listen to podcasts, but, um, you know, be nice to chat it up with one of my friends, especially friends that, you know, maybe I haven't seen in a while or especially now during coronavirus when we're all so isolated from each other. So, okay. Um, feel free. Well, thank you. You can link it up with Waze because Waze can tell you how much of your commute is left. And that way, you know who's available. But that would limit it, to your point, that would limit it to people who are commuting, not people who are just available to chat who might not be commuting. Maybe they're folding laundry or, I don't know, or or they just have spare time. But that doesn't seem like a real situation anymore, does it? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really interesting Really good idea. Um, I think that to just back up a little bit, I would say that um, you know one thing that you really need is you you definitely have to have more than an idea, especially if you want to have a co-founder involved that's going to put equity into your company. And so, you know, coming from the medical field, I guess I would say that you usually probably would want to bring either you know some sort of other background that you have or something medically related to the table in terms of being able to bring contracts or you know business or marketing or media attention and so you know part of being able to recruit a co-founder is showing them that you could do something more than produce a great idea which i think all of us have had great ideas in the past yours is a really good one but i, I guess i would struggle to see you know where someone would um agree to go 50 50 with you on that idea because i think um 90 of that would be engineering but um it's a brilliant yeah. idea well thank you But that's why I was willing to publicize it because I know that I will never, ever do anything with it because I don't have any of the resources for it or expertise. This isn't my area. You know, I wouldn't even know where to begin other than telling someone, here's my idea, and there's nothing to stop them from going, that's great. I'm just going to do it myself. So sure, I give it up willingly. Why? Because I want to talk to my friends while I'm commuting. You know, Brad. You know, if your if your podcast keeps growing, then I think you could uh, offer a significant amount of uh, equity in terms of just a uh, publicity for this great idea. Thanks. It's got to grow Free quite a bit. I, I, it's got to grow quite a bit. I'm going to need you to to um, help me with the SEO. Speaking of which, um, do you have any secrets for SEO? Because I just had an interview with uh, Marjorie Stiegler, and we were talking about SEO, and her point was you really want to not just get at the top of the search engine by vomiting a bunch of content out there. 
you want to make sure that the people that are finding you are the people that you want to find you. So that was her bit of advice. What is yours as someone who constantly wants to get their material to the to the top of the search engine? What is your bit of advice if I want the physician's guide to doctoring to be found or we, you know, we all want our own content to be found? How, how do we get that? Yeah, you know, it's really hard actually to guess what Google's thinking about. Google, they put out uh, countdown outlines in terms of you know the best way to get recognized. And it, it tends to be most of people's advice is really just to create good content, um, which is really hard because you're competing with, I think, 4 million new blog posts every day. And so I think, you know, one thing as doctors is that uh, there's, you know, Google has talked about their focus on YMYL, which is, I think, your money, your life. And um, they really want to make sure that stuff is coming from vetted content and and people with actual you know degrees. And so I would say, you know, in terms of medical content, um, make sure that you put your name out there, even in multiple places. Make sure that you have links to, to other profiles like your Doximity account, um, you know, other places where your, your credentials can sort of be verified. Feel free to throw in any certifications onto your website so that Google's um, AI can recognize you as an expert in that in that in that field, but um, you know it, a lot of it is so much up in the air and, and up to the artificial intelligence of Google. I think our biggest secret for the way that we've grown our domain authority with Google is really just to not die. Um, I think we were toiling along for a while, and a lot of bloggers do this, and a lot of podcasters as well. But I think not disappearing after that first year or two and continuing to put out content. At some point, Google recognizes that uh, you're not just a flash in the pan and that you're going to continue to put out content. People slowly start to link back to you. And I think um, that's a big part of it as well, is getting people to link to your website. And the more that happens, things tend to snowball. And so for us, we've really been just growing 5 to 10% per month pretty consistently for the past year or two. But um, it really felt like after that first year of just consistently putting out content and growing our database, that's when we saw the most growth. I think Seth Godin calls it the dip. I'm not sure if I'm misquoting him where, you, where you're where you like pushing through the creation of your content and it seems like you're not getting anywhere. You're not making progress. And this is when everyone quits. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You just can't see it. So if you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, what you're saying is at some point, at some point, you'll hit an inflection point. Keep producing content. At some point, there'll be enough links to you, which then increases your likelihood of being found. And then more people will link to you, which increases your likelihood of being. So just keep pushing and keep pushing. Okay, that's reasonable, reasonable advice. I can definitely do that. Uh, I'm hoping to hit my inflection point soon. But so please, please, everybody share this. Okay. So you started off in software. Then you went to medical school. And then you went into radiology and then you went into internal medicine. And now you have this side gig where you combine the computer science with medicine. So what's next for Gerald Diaz? Yeah, I think uh, for me, my goal is really to just grow GrepMed as big as I can. Um, it would be nice if, uh, you know, again, if we got out of the red to be able to take a few shifts off so that I'm not having to pay for this with uh, the the clinical medicine work. Um, but um, if I could actually take a, you know, reduce my time down to 50% and be able to work on this uh, and grow this uh, so that it can be helpful for clinicians around the world. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, we're not, you know, curing burnout or anything like that. But, um, you know, if we could save doctors, you know, five seconds here, five seconds there, so much of medicine is unfortunately death by a thousand paper cuts. And so, you know, that's really our goal is to to really just help as many clinicians as we can across the world from um, helping them find information more quickly. Yeah. I mean, you're making it egalitarian, right? You're, I'm not sure that's the right word, is it? But um, you're democratizing it. You're democratizing the information that was otherwise would have been behind paywalls and, and harder to find. And especially in countries that don't have the ease of access to, you know, new textbooks and, and the latest experts, uh, you're really making it available to, to them. So it's, it's, this isn't just an American medical education platform. This is, you know, just because uh, English tends to be the language of medicine, you're really making it available to so many more people. Yeah, a lot of people in these developing countries can't afford those 
$500 per year subscription websites. And so it's definitely our goal to make sure that this remains free and open access for everyone around the world. And so I think um, it's really fulfilling to see, you know, we're being used by over 190 month, uh, countries every month. And um, all, so much of our bandwidth is, is just global and uh, our users are global, which is just really exciting. So where can we find Grepman? And more importantly, how can my listeners help you to curate content? Maybe add some content and offload some of that responsibility from you. Yeah, if you're a medical educator, I think you'll find that uh, on Twitter, there's a, there's a really big community of people posting content. And it's kind of a shame because they post on Twitter. And uh, if you don't have 20,000 followers, you know your, your image that you post might be gone the next day. And so we really provide a platform for people to share you know, really high yield tables or graphics uh, that they might prepare for a conference. And then um, you know, nobody sees it again. Um, we Our platform is evergreen. We expose you to the Google search engine. And a lot of our images have been seen over a million times. And so, um, you know, come check us out. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, send me a message and let me know that you, you found out about us through this podcast. And I'd love to send you a bunch of our pens so that we can, uh, you know, help help us lose their, our, our pens throughout your hospital and get the word out about our resources. <laughs> I, love, I love it. I love it. And yeah, for even for like medical students out there, you give a grand rounds and you think, man, I came up with this great way to remember this. I came up with this great way to think about this concept, content. It didn't make sense for me until I did X, Y, and Z. You, you, you made it easier for, for yourself. Now make it easier for everyone else and get it on GrepMed so that we can all benefit from your hard work and your great idea and your great way of thinking. Gerald Diaz, thank you so much for creating this. Thank you for creating this space that's going to help us all work more efficiently. And yeah, it is going to it is going to help burn out because right, you make it a little less taxing every day just a little bit easier, every patient just a little bit easier. It, it adds up. So thank you for for creating the content and uh and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Brad. Thanks for having us on your podcast. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from Physician Financial Services, a business widely recognized in the physician community for disability insurance. Circumstantially, it also happens to be located about five minutes from my house. Lawrence B. Keller, CFP, has been in the insurance and financial services industry since 1990. Unlike medicine, which has a standardized path that physicians must take to gain the education, training, and experience requirements necessary to obtain board certification, the insurance and financial services industry does not. So working with an agent that is familiar with the underwriting process of both disability and life insurance policies for physicians can all but guarantee a smooth underwriting process in which the desired outcome is likely. While he might not be a doctor's first phone call regarding their insurance needs, he is often their last. Find Larry at drpodcastnetwork.com slash Larry Keller or at the link in the show notes. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.